Thank you for joining us today. Today's message is about life, life as it really is. And it seems like the more people I talk to, it seems like life is getting more complicated and more difficult all the time. How do we handle the way life has been lately? Well, I want to share with you in the life of Paul today, how he handled the things in his life. And then I believe we'll have some ideas of how we can make the most of any situation. Before we begin, let me just have a short word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity. And I know that these words will go wherever you want them to go. And I believe they'll be received by whomever receives them. But I do pray that you'll give me an anointing and that people receive the words that they need to hear. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want to start with the life of the Apostle Paul. Some people say the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian that ever lived. Well, I can't verify that. I've never met Paul. I don't know how to compare him to all the centuries of people that have been Christians. In fact, I know that Paul would not appreciate it because the chapter before that I'm looking at today, he even says that it's almost sinful to compare yourself with other situations or other people. But I want to talk about the Apostle Paul, his life, how he had to handle it, because life really wasn't that well to him. My scripture lesson is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. I'll be reading from the message today. Paul wrote, I've worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten more times than I can count, and at death's door time after time. I've been flogged five times with the Jewish 39 lashes, beaten by the Romans' rods three times, plummeted with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times, immersed in the open sea for a day and a night, in hard traveling year in and year out. I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city. I've been at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea storms, and betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I had drudgery and hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a messed meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather. Oh, that's been a hard life. 
But look what he says. And that's not the half of it. When you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of the churches, when someone gets to the end of his ropes, I feel the desperation in my bones. And when someone is dubbed into sin, an angry fire burns in my gut. Life was not easy for the Apostle Paul. He had one problem after another. Would you allow me to make a confession to you? It's about me, one of my weaknesses. You see, I know it's not true, but I have never been able to get it completely out of my mind, and ever so often it keeps coming back. But there's a part of me that says, if I do God's will, I'm constantly doing what he wants me to do, that he's going to protect me, give me some type of help. Then I look at the Apostle Paul, and he wrote half of the New Testament. He also uh, started more churches than we even know. We only know about a few of them, but there's others that he started. And, And yet he had this kind of a lifestyle to put up with. Nowadays, life is getting so difficult. I talked to one just this morning that talked about, said, you know, I'm just so tired of living like a prisoner. She happens to be in an in a assisted living place, and she's not allowed to have any visitors. No one can come see her. Family can't come see her. She can't go out and see anybody. And she said, I feel like a prisoner. I wish you'd just take me home. Some of you may feel some of that frustration as well. I want to talk today about what Paul did, or at least what it looks like he did in his life, and how it can help us make the most of any situation. My first point is this. Refuse. Just refuse to be a victim. Now, wait just a second. Please note. I know the moment I say that, Someone's going to misinterpret that. Let let me let me say it this way. I did not say I did not. I did not say you are not a victim. There are many more victims in our world and probably right here in our church today that have been a victim of some kind than we can even begin to imagine. I was a victim many years ago of a scam. Long before they had phone scams, I was scammed by something else, a very costly mistake. I've been the victim of a robbery. I don't go to tell all the stories that I have, but I can tell you that I'm sure that your story is among them. Something has happened to you that has caused some kind of a victimization mine. Let me, let me give one example. It's a, it's a very tender one, but it's one that I want to share. It, it's a story about molestation of children. It's something that I just have a hard time understanding. I can't even hardly imagine it. But yet it tells us that 20% of our girls will be molested before the age of 18. That's one out of every five. And all we have to do is just kind of look around and count one, two, three, four, five. One of them probably could have been a victim of molestation. That doesn't even count the boys. They're 12%. They're also, it's on the rise. And, and there's so many more statistics that I could share about that. And, and because the sensitivity, I just want to be very careful how I say it. One, one is simply this. Did you know most of the ladies that are victims are unable to tell anybody for at least a year, a year. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. It uh, could be that because they're very ashamed. Uh, sometimes they blame themselves. Um, often, 50% of the time, it is a close house relative. It could be a father How do you tell your mother what dad did? It it could be a brother. Who's going to believe that story? And and so there's different reasons why they are unable to speak. But you see, every day of their life, they live that day as a victim. 13% of those have attempted suicide. When they were contacted and talked to, 
A story came out. Well, it's because what happened when I was this age. That doesn't count those that were successful in taking their own life. That does not speak of those that didn't try and have lived their entire life in silence. I, I just say this as an example simply to say this. It's a terrible thing to be a victim. And if you're a victim, I am very sorry. And if you're one of those that have asked this question, where was God? I can tell you that God saw that. I can tell you that God hurt and God cried. I have feelings that sometimes God wishes he had never given man free will. I also know that in the Bible it tells us that in the last days, which I believe we're living in, in these last days, it's going to turn us over to our reprobate mind, our depraved mind, that evil mind, and we're going to see evil continue to get worse and worse. God hates people that victimize other people. He doesn't hate them. He hates what they do. Now, getting back to this, I, I want you to know that some would say, well, we live in a wonderful city. That must be some crime-filled city that has that kind of statistics. No, no, it's every, every state has these kind of statistics. In fact, if you take the per capita, meaning one person per 100,000 people, the state of Oklahoma has more female incarcerated people than any other state in the union. Something else I just learned. Of those in, the, in Oklahoma prisons, 90% of them have been molested. Enough of the statistics. What I'm just trying to say is, I know for a fact, many people have become victims in one way or another. Here, here's some of them I've, I've dealt with recently. One of them told me, well, I was just a mistake. My parents didn't even want me. I was a surprise. Others would say things like this. Uh, that's why I had to get married. I didn't even love them, but I was pregnant and I had to get married. And another one said, well, they love the sibling, my brother or my sister, more. You see, she's the smart one, or she's the loved one, or he's the athlete. We just find other reasons that we say, I am a victim. I've even had people tell me, well, I didn't get the job because, well, somebody else has the inside track. They're pulling some kind of favors for others. And uh, that's the reason why I was the best qualified, but I didn't get it. You see, you see, there are so many different stories where we become victims. And you may be a victim, and I'm sorry. But I want to tell you this. Don't be a victim every day for the rest of your life. Refuse to be a victim. Let me give you some mindset of a victimized person. This is just what seems to be common among them. You may be one of those that say, well, I was a victim, but no, no, I don't, I don't have that problem anymore. Well, well, let me just share a few of the things that I've learned over the years. Number one is that people that have been a victim usually have a negative outlook. Everything's wrong. Something's wrong with something. I mean, they're just, nothing is ever just right. It's just something's wrong. A second one is they're asking the question, why? Why me? Why is it always me? Why, why now? I mean, this is the worst time in the world for this thing to happen to me. We're always asking why. There's a third one that I notice quite often, and that's when they dwell on a certain situation in their past. Whatever that story is, they just keep telling themselves that same story over and over again. And over again. And when, when uh, <clears throat> the moment comes, the first thing we think of was, well, that's what happened to me. And that's what it is. It's something in the past. Low self-esteem is a fourth one that people have. They just don't think too highly of themselves. And the last one that I've seen probably more than any of the others, and that is they're quick, very quick to become angry. There's something like there's a, so much anger and so much hurt inside our lives that it doesn't take much to trigger it. 
I say to you, if you're a victim, from this day forward, refuse to live the life of a victim. Well, how do we do that? Well, here's a good thing that'll help. Accept responsibility for your future. We're always looking to someone to blame. You know that? We find something, someone or something to blame for whatever goes wrong in our lives. Such as, well, when I was a kid, I had the measles. I didn't have just the measles. I had the German measles. Later on, I came up with the flu, <laughs> the Hong Kong flu. And there's a lot of people that's come with COVID, and it's the China COVID. You see, we're always trying to blame bad things on other people. I've learned I can only control me. I cannot control what others do or what they don't do, wish I could, but I I find myself I have to control myself. The other day I was in uh, the Ace Hardware, and I was in line, and I was obeying the six-foot distance, and the guy in front of me who didn't have a mask, who was supposed to have a mask, was coughing and coughing and coughing. He finally started coughing in his sleeve a little bit. And I thought to myself, six foot or no six foot, this boy's leaving. I walked away from the store, way around the store, made sure he got through the line, and then I came and paid for my merchandise. I I say that to say, I can't stop someone from coughing, but I can Determine what I'm going to do. I'm not going to sit here and let him cough in my presence. Let me give you a few others. I know people that are late. And if you're one of those people, I'm not talking to you. Okay, I'm not saying it's you. You're not my illustration this morning. But I know some people that are always late. And, And they always have an excuse. And we have some that we tell them 30 minutes before the real time, hoping they'll get there by the real time. And usually they're still late then. Uh, They're they're just coming up with some kind of reason. Something always made them late. And uh, it's never their fault. I don't know. Do do kids still blame dogs for their homework not being done? Uh, Some of the things I laughed about in my past was, uh, insurance, the excuses that people make about why they had an accident. I, one of my favorites, it's simple like this. He said, I was just driving down the road and out of nowhere, this, this telephone pole showed up and I weaved two or three times, but I still hit it. Isn't it amazing that a telephone pole was responsible for that? We just have to come to the point where we say, no more excuses. The Apostle Paul Regardless of what happened to him, he decided he was going to be upbeat and positive about everything. I I can imagine these kind of conversations going on. Paul, if you don't stop preaching, we're going to arrest you. He just said, oh, been there, done that. That's okay. Well, Paul, if you don't quit this preaching, we're going to beat you. Well, I've had 39 lashes five times. I've also been beaten by the Roman rod three. Well, we're going to throw you in prison. Which one? I've been to most of them. Paul, if you don't quit this preaching, if you don't stop right now, we're going to kill you. Oh, would you please? I am so torn. I want to be here with my brothers and sisters in the Lord and help them. But yet I want to be with Jesus. I'm just, I'm just so torn which way I want to kind of live. I, I say that to say, you see, Paul decided you can do whatever you're going to do, but I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to be right and positive about that. And my third point, make a positive difference. You want to get out of the victim mindset? Make a positive difference in the life of someone else. You can make any situation better. You don't just have to sit there, endure it, pout, complain, or blame others. Do something good for others. I have a a responsibility that I get thanked for over and over again, and I think nothing of it. Every week of my life, I'm... 
I've got people that I visit, I take medicine to, I take food to. It's just the kind of thing I just want to make their life better, especially in this situation. And so I try to make a positive difference. I like what Mandy Hill said. You can see it in the picture. She said, be, she's talking about whoever reads it, you be the positive difference. Make the phone call. There was a time in my life when my sister, just below me, alienated herself from the entire family. And there was no communication, and she didn't want communication, and she even rejected if you tried to have communication with her. So one day when I was, I was preaching around the Christmas time, I said, this is a wonderful time to make a man. Call that family member that you're at odds with. And just like that, the Holy Spirit said, call your sister. I wanted to say, uh, I'm kind of busy right now. You know, I'm kind of preaching here. What, what's, what's going on? And, but that thought never left me. So the first thing I did after church, I called my sister. And I made contact with her. I made arrangements to see her. I went to visit her. A and the first time I went, it was, it was rejection for me, but I wouldn't stop. I decided, well, I'll be back. Let me know what I can come up. She lived in Wichita. I lived a long ways off St. Louis, but I made it down to see her ever so often. I say that just to say, you can make the difference. All you have to do is that. Today, I want to be honest with you. If you're a victim, I hate it. I'm sorry. I wish it, I could fix it. I wish it had never happened. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, you may be wondering why God didn't stop it. Well, it's because he gave us this free will. Uh, you can be who you want to be. Just refuse to be a victim and take responsibility for your future. You need to quit blaming others. You just are the total sum of your choices and just start living no more excuses. And be sure to make a positive difference. You can make any situation better. Why not start today? I'd like to have a closing prayer with you. Father, for every victim that's heard this message, something that we can do nothing about, but we're going to make sure that it doesn't destroy us every day of our life. We're going to refuse, with the help of God, to be a victim any longer. I pray you'll comfort them. Pray that you'll be close. I pray you'll help them to accept responsibility, even when it's not their fault. Anyone, even though they had nothing to do with it, they were a true victim. And show us what we can do to someone and for someone to make a positive difference today. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen.